And we are underway uh, once again. Welcome to uh, the first uh, January meeting of 2021, uh, our monthly membership meeting for the West Seattle Transportation Coalition. My name is Michael Taylor Judd. Um, I am the chair of the West Seattle Transportation Coalition, and I will be uh, the main host this evening. Um, joining me is one of our board members, Kate, um, who will also be serving as co-host and doing some moderation of the chat and questions when we open that up. Um, Kate, if you want to say hi, feel free. Hello. I'll be talking a little bit later. On tonight's agenda, um, if you haven't seen already, um, we have some brief business that we'll conduct here at the beginning with some introductions, um, explanations about how things run. Um, quick, uh, I believe we had minutes to approve, don't we, Kate? Um, and then we, we will- should have two months. Uh, oh, right. October I know. I knew I had something wrong there, October yeah. and November. So small change to the agenda. Um, we uh, have a number of guests uh, with us this evening, although lots of familiar faces that we've had uh, uh, in last year and sometimes even before last year. Um, we'll have our brief check-in um, with Seattle Department of Transportation. They'll be talking to us a little bit about uh, camera enforcement, which just got underway on the lower bridge, um, some of the progress that's been happening on mobility projects, um, and a little bit as well about what to expect from upcoming work on the First Avenue Bridge. Um, although we will be having a guest from WashDOT joining us next month. Um, so that's a good reminder to everyone that the First Avenue Bridge is not a Seattle owned bridge. And so what happens there is not SDOT's responsibility. They work with the state on that. Um, and then we will launch into our larger discussion this evening. Um, we have a number of guests joining us again from Sound Transit. Um, if you uh, were distracted over the holidays or just trying to take a breather from news, um, you may have missed some of the larger uh, announcements that have happened around, uh, you know, delays, officially announced uh, delays to planning an ESI EIS work for extensions due to COVID, which should come as no surprise. Um, some recently revised cost estimates, which we hope to talk about with them tonight. Um, as well as trying to get just some sense um, of where staff might think the board is or, or how they'll be advising the board in the next few months over uh, what we think how the impact of reduced revenues is going to have on delivering these projects in the future and what should we be prepared for here in West Seattle. Um, and then uh, after all that, uh, we'll have a little bit of open discussion and chat. Um, start of the year here, find out what is it that you want to learn about this year and what are some of your top concerns to make sure we're still covering things um, that you want to hear about. Um, I have old business and new business there, although I don't have anything under those uh, items. So unless board members have things to bring up there or members. Um, and a reminder that uh, meetings are continuing on the fourth Thursdays of the month, generally speaking, here for 2021. And as far as we know, we will be here in this Zoom environment for some time to come. Um, and we plan to be adjourned by 8.30. Um, again, if you're just joining us for the first time, um, purposes on the screen, you know, the West Seattle Transportation Coalition is a peninsula-wide organization working to address transportation and commuting challenges for the nearly 100,000 people living and working here on the West Seattle Peninsula. And we do that by securing support of residents, uh, engaging elected officials um, at all levels, and that's for all transportation users. We're not just cars, we're not just buses, um, but all forms of mobility. We partner with government agencies to achieve outcomes, um, as you can see tonight from the guests we have. And uh, we're constantly trying to think about how we can engage with businesses, community groups, um, individuals, um, to collect feedback and let those uh, partners and elected officials know what it is that folks want to learn about. Our goals are affordable and equitable transportation options, particularly in historically under underserved neighborhoods. Um, we support a transportation network that moves people and goods in an environmentally sustainable way. And we'd like to see investments in transportation infrastructure that match Seattle's growth. 
Our priorities in 2021 shouldn't be shocking. They look exactly like they did in 2020. Um, we're still concerned with restoring capacity in the West Seattle Bridge Transportation Corridor, especially while the high bridge is closed. We'll be advocating for funding as much mobility as possible while we're in that situation here. We continue to support Sound Transit 3 light rail planning, and we're keeping a close eye on uh, progress with the Delridge Way and Rapid Ride H multimodal project. Uh, Kate, I uh, want to do a quick cover on Zoom and chat uh, if folks are not familiar with that, and I will uh, get our chat window open. Hello, I will be facilitating the uh, question and answer periods today, and um, there are a few different ways that you can let me know if you've got a question. Um, one way is to raise your hand in the participant window, and also another way is in the chat. And you can either type in your question and I can ask it for you, or you can um, let me know that you have a question and I'll just put you in the queue. Um, I think that's it. Back to you, Michael. All right. Uh, introductions. So don't worry, we're not going to open up the lines and let everybody uh, chat away. Um, we direct folks to, I will ask board members to quickly um, introduce themselves. And so I'll give people the opportunity to unmute. Um, but for everybody else, uh, we direct you to the chat window, which is available now. And we ask people to share your name, uh, pronouns or access needs. Um, what neighborhood you're from in uh, West Seattle, or if you're joining us from elsewhere. Um, and then our, uh, our question that we'd love to get some answers for um, this month um, is, what is one discovery you have made during the, during the current reroutes from the bridge? Um, is there some new food establishment, a view, um, a new pathway somewhere that you weren't aware of? And, and, you know, what are some of the positives that we can find in the fact that we're altering our transportation patterns? Um, and then finally, um, if you didn't get an email reminder uh, about this meeting and, and the topics and guests, and you want to be added to our email list, um, you can switch to send a private chat message rather than everyone. You can send that to John Wright. Um, and uh, John can make sure you get added on. Uh, and so board members, um, as we said, we need to approve October and November, um, as of course we didn't have a December meeting. Um, so our last two meetings, um, I would entertain a motion. I'll make uh, a motion. Second. All right. And uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Um, we will move ahead then uh, to first folks up on our agenda. Um, so as I said, we're starting out with what's become a monthly update right now with the uh, Seattle Department of Transportation. Um, I'm sure some people will be bummed. Heather is not going to be able to join us tonight, um, but we do have our favorites, Sarah Zora, Trevor Partap, and Madison Lincolnmeyer here uh, with us. Um, if folks need some more information, you can go to that uh, website address right there about what's going on with the West Seattle Bridge. Um, otherwise, uh, Madison, I believe you, you'll be taking away to share uh, to share some slides with us. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for having us here. Uh, we really appreciate you making space on your agenda for uh, SDOT to share some updates. Heather does send her regards, and she is very much looking. Uh, she's very much excited to see you guys next month. Um, so you will have Trevor and I and Madison tonight. And Michael, I'm sorry, could you give access to that other Madison on the screen? Sorry. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's fine. I'm working on two computers. Yes, there you go. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Madison. 
So um, if you go to the next slide tonight, we're going to be talking, uh, we are not going to be giving a um, high rise bridge update. Um, Heather will do that next month. Um, we are anticipating uh, receiving the 30% designs for the um, repair work on the high bridge um, in the early part of February. So by the end of February, we'll have a decent update for you guys about what's been happening for the high bridge 30% uh, design plans. Um, tonight, we're going to really focus on a traffic update. Trevor's going to give you a little snapshot of some of the data that we are constantly looking at to make sure that we're really having a sense of um, how traffic behavior is um, acting and, and be, uh, people are traveling. I'll give you an update on Reconnect West Seattle, uh, some of our accomplishments from 2020 and a look ahead to 2021. I'm only going to give a quick update on uh, low bridge automated enforcement. And um, as Michael said at the beginning, we just started that photo enforcement on uh, January 11th. So we're still getting uh, some of that data back. Um, and then Trevor is going to talk a little bit about um, the uh, upcoming wash work on the First Avenue Bridge and some of our interaction with WashDOT on that. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Trev, go ahead. All right, go thanks. I'll just jump right in here. And um, what this is, is uh, the data for uh, 2020. Um, and it kind of shows um, some interesting patterns. Um, so I want to highlight basically how the three bridges work together. So the top graph actually shows the Spokane Street Swing Bridge, the middle graph shows the South Park Bridge and uh, the First Avenue South Bridge on the bottom. Um, so um, you'll also notice that I have some dashed lines labeled A through E. Um, and those highlight uh, larger changes in traffic volumes um, on one bridge or another at a particular point in time. So for example, line A um, represents the uh, start of uh, SPD enforcement on the low bridge. So you see the traffic volumes drop on the, on the Spokane Street Bridge and the uh, volumes increase on the other two. Um, and then at point B, um, you'll actually see, this is where the governor um, eased the COVID restrictions at the end of May. And so traffic volumes on all three bridges actually went up. Um, line C is um, when we open the low bridge to all traffic in the overnight hours. So the daily volumes um, increased on the Spokane Street Bridge and then uh, dropped on South Park Bridge and First Avenue South Bridge stayed about the same. Um, so, and then going over to point D here, um, the governor had announced some new COVID restrictions. So all three bridges, the volumes kind of dropped. And then E is when um, the Thanksgiving holiday kind of ended and uh, traffic patterns kind of bumped up a little bit as we got into, uh, into December. Um, so all of these um, Tableau charts are available at the link um, on this slide here. Um, and we also have uh, more recent data, so you can actually see a little bit more about the volume data and how, um, how traffic volumes uh, might have dropped off a little bit on the Spokane Street Swing Bridge um, related to photo enforcement. So we'll, we'll be updating this link uh, frequently here. So um, just if you guys are interested, you can go and check on your own and, uh, and, and see what's happening on the three bridges. Next slide, please. So, um, so very similarly, these are uh, the, here we have the 2019 numbers for uh, transit uh, boardings, uh, water taxi boardings, and the bike counter on the Spokane Street Swing Bridge. So the 2019 numbers are shown in gray, and the 2020 numbers are shown in green. Um, the one thing I'll highlight is one error here is the um, the y-axis on the water taxi boardings actually are off by a factor of about 10, but um, it's updated on the uh, on the link at the bottom of this sheet uh, as well. But generally, what I want to talk about was the was the trends here. So, um, very much as you as you would expect in uh, 2020, the uh, transit ridership uh, kind of dropped off in March and kind of stayed low for the rest of the year. Um, similarly, with the water taxi, um, it kind of dropped off and stayed low consistently through the year. Um, and then, as you look at the bike counters on the bottom. Um, you know, generally the, the patterns kind of stayed the same. March was a little bit off for, um, for bicycling and kind of dropped off instead of starting to um, rise throughout the month. Um, so basically 2020 volumes were down, but generally followed the same trends um, as 2019. 
the one interesting thing that you'll note here is in September, you'll see kind of a little bit of a U shape um, with the green line. And normally they, they kind of just uh, spike down for the weekends and then they kind of spike back up for the weekdays. Um, but this is one uh, data point that I was kind of curious about. And really that's when uh, the smoke from the wildfires came into the, to the area and um, people just weren't riding their bikes as much, obviously, just because of that. So, um, so anyways, um, you know, we'll continue to monitor these travel patterns, um, you know, with our partner agencies as COVID restrictions ease, and we'll look for ways of keeping travel into and out of West Seattle um, as efficient as possible. So um, now I'll pass it on mm -hmm. to Sarah to talk about uh, Reconnect West Seattle. Thanks, Trev. Um, yep, so I wanted to really talk about uh, the 2020 uh, implementation plan. Um, we, had 2020, uh, we had 22 projects to be delivered in 2020, um, and we have delivered all those projects. Uh, in the implementation plan that we have, we had five goals. Um, and so looking at the uh, projects from 2020 and 2021, uh, we're kind of trying to say that we've accomplished 25 of the 48 uh, plan projects that we have that would um, address increased traffic volumes and other impacts along detour routes. Um, so we have started to obviously achieve some of the goals that we have in the plan. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Madison, um, it's just really reflecting on uh, what the goals were and how we are trying to get to achieve them. So we are on track to achieving all the uh, Reconnect West Seattle implementation plan goals, uh, starting with that 2020 uh, project delivery. If you go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about more about 2021. What is coming up in this next year? Um, in the Reconnect West Seattle implementation plan, we have 33 projects on that plan. Um, there will probably be more projects that we're going to be implementing from that implementation plan because home zones um, you know, are kind of listed as one project and they're really going to be a bunch of different outcomes and projects coming out of home zones. Um, our home zones were actually at um, Georgetown C Community Council on Monday of this week. We were at the um, HPAC community meeting last night and the team is at the South Park Neighborhood Association meeting right now to talk about the home zone plan there. Um, for South Park and Georgetown, those two neighborhood neighborhoods are a little bit further ahead uh, in the planning and design process. So we really went back to the, those communities um, this week to try to finalize um, uh, the plans. Uh, and then we're going to really start to try to implement some of those priority projects, which we really are considering with the community, the cut through of uh, on neighborhood traffic streets. So really trying to have some traffic calming uh, implemented as early as we can um, in 2021, hopefully quarter one. Um, so that is something to really look forward to if you live in uh, South Park in Georgetown and start to see some of the improvements that we've been talking about with the community uh, for the last little couple of months. Um, part of what we are doing is all the neighborhood ballots that were filled out as well um, uh, from the engagement process last summer. So we're, those are also included with, um, within that Reconnect West Seattle implementation plan. Um, as you guys know, I've said before, we have the implementation plan. We also have a whole leg of the team working on just traffic management along the detour routes itself. So um, our team did an assessment of all the detour routes um, at the end of December to really get a sense of the uh, speeds. And so we have uh, recognized that we will be installing eight more radar feedback signs on the detour, detour arterial routes so that we can really try to manage um, the speeding and help with the education of the speeds that people are supposed to be going. Uh, Trevor had his team look at the detour routes um, and a pavement assessment. So we will have some um, damage Pavement, uh, pavement improvements coming um, that will help uh, make sure that the detour routes are staying uh, quite efficient for the transit and uh, people driving as they need. Um, and we have, we're working with King, King County Metro and SDOT will be delivering um, five transit spot improvements um, this year as well. Um, we are still continuing to collect input for 2022 projects. We have been, um, we have a whole internal kind of backdoor system of all the emails that we get uh, through that West Seattle Bridge at seattle.gov email address. Um, and we have constantly been um, vetting those projects with operations and then putting, on, putting them on a list of feasible or not feasible for potential pro 
projects coming in 2022 uh, project deliveries. So we're working on that list now. We're going to be uh, telling the community right at this time if there are other projects or impacts that you have been feeling or seeing because of the um, closure of that West Yellow Bridge. Uh, now, between now and towards um, the end of February would be about that time to make sure you're emailing that web, web address and seeing how new projects might be able to get uh, built in 2022 to mitigate the impacts that you're feeling. So that's a pretty important thing to make sure you're spreading to your community um, members as well. We do have this uh, project dashboard. Um, it's just the map um, on our website uh, where you can look at the 2020 and 2021 projects to get a little bit more information in the status of where those are. Uh, next slide, Madison, thank you. Um, to remind you as well, we also we have the implementation plan, which is really the capital projects of Reconnect West Seattle. We have the traffic mitigation side of things, which is really about the efficiencies and making sure people are able to travel around. Um, and then we also have the mobility action plan. The mobility action plan side is really about how are we going to um, try to ensure people are able to travel safely um, um, uh, with the West Salem Bridge closure, and especially in the in the time frame that we're considering as COVID recovery time and the bridge still being closed. So that's really an important part where uh, back in the summertime, we did a big engagement push to really have a better sense of how people are traveling uh, pre-COVID, um, how they think they might travel post-COVID, um, and then really trying to get a sense of what can the city do with our partners to make sure that we have um, these different options available and accessible to people to be able to try if they're willing and able to take a new um, mode other than their single occupancy vehicle. So some of the things that we've been doing for that, if you go to the next slide, Madison, um, you know, when with COVID restrictions now, we have been really trying to push with King County Metro and our in Commute Seattle as a partner, um, the van pool promotions. And this is particularly important um, in conjunction with that, uh, the low bridge. Um, uh, access restrictions and, and uh, authorized users. So if you do have a van pool, um, you are able to take that low bridge to um, commute to work and such. Um, so we're really trying to work with healthcare providers, especially, um, and seeing if there's any appropriate ways that we can have uh, healthcare providers um, uh, match up on a van pool. You only need one or one, uh, you can't just have one person, you need two people to have a van pool right now. Um, and so we're just trying to help promote that idea. Um, we, uh, our partners at King County Metro have recognized that there are three routes that even with our COVID uh, bus capacity constraints, they're feeling crowding on that. So Metro uh, for this March service hour, will be adding a few service hours um, onto the routes 50, 60 and the 128 coming up here at that March time. Um, we do meet monthly with our um, the employee resource group, which is really a group of the larger employers um, in the city of Seattle, and really hoping to have a better sense of uh, their upcoming COVID recovery plans, when they uh, plan to send people back to work, and how can we really promote a lot of the employee shuttles that a lot of them have and make sure that there's still going to be ways for their employees to get around without having to travel to work if they go back uh, to work in person um, in their single occupancy vehicle. Um, we also we also have launched a travel options website. There's some really good information there um, about staying local, about how to access different trips or um, micro mobility such as bike and scooter share. So there's a website that is helping at least generate some ideas about different ways that you can get around in your neighborhood um, or across the Duwamish River at this time. Um, upcoming here for COVID recovery, uh, we're really looking at um, um, using um, excuse me, uh, uh, the Seattle Transportation Business uh, Benefit District is the um, is the uh, the vote that the Seattle voters just voted on to increase um, uh, transit speed and reliability throughout Seattle. Uh, in November, we had 80% of the vote voted yes for that. In the STBD, STBD funds, um, there is an emerging um, issues kind of bucket. And in, in the legislation for that, West Seattle Bridge closure was one of the things and COVID that you can use for the emerging funds. So we are planning to work with our transit mobility division and can County Metro to really think about what uh, transit routes should be getting those service hours. And we would be planning for those service hours coming in September 2021. Uh, you know, King County Metro does their service changes in March or September of that year for that next service change. So that's what the what we're looking for towards um, is that September 20, 
uh, 2021 service change. Um, we also just put out um, an RFP out for a consultant to help with um, a travel options portal, more like a platform so that we can um, have some kind of um, web based tool to really promote and entice people to try to take different modes. Um, and so that will be in the works coming up here in the first quarter, second quarter of 2021. And we'll be interacting with the community on that as well. Um, another thing that we're doing is um, working with our um, University of Washington Urban Freight Lab um, to really think about um, uh, surveying uh, businesses, maritime industrial businesses, to really get a sense of how they need uh, delivery to and from off the peninsula and on the peninsula. And um, our, our freight team with the partnership of University of Washington will be coming up with some uh, freight proposals for mobility um, as we're in this closure of the high bridge. Um, so th that's kind of where we are with the mobility action plan at this time. And we're constantly working uh, to try to make sure all of we're on um, the same point with our partners. Um, one major project that I want to address in, a, in, in not a very long way today, but a more of a snapshot um, is West Marginal Way. Um, I've come here before and talked about some of the proposals we have on here, and I'm just going to talk a little bit more about uh, proposals for the, um, the, the other section of uh, West Marginal Way, that southbound outside lane. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Madison. Um, just in terms of the context, um, the first proposal that I came and talked about last time was the orange line between section one, it's called, between West Marginal, Southwest Marginal um, Place and um, Southwest Idaho Street about where um, uh, the existing um, Duwamish River Trail signal um, kind of, and uh, Duwamish River Trail ends at that signal at South Idaho, Southwest Idaho. Um, so it's SDOT's first proposal for that um, section was to um, install a protected bike lane in that outside uh, uh, curb lane in the southbound direction. Um, uh, and if you go to the next slide, Madison. Um, oh, I'll talk a little bit about the construction projects that are coming up here for sure in 2021. Um, we do have the at the Duwamish Longhouse, um, a couple uh, hundred feet or so to the north, uh, we will be installing an interim um, signal for better pedestrian access um, to and from the Duwamish Longhouse. And along with that, we will be installing a sidewalk, a pedestrian pathway on that west side of the street as well, so that they can have uh, visitors and people that um, attend the Duwamish Longhouse can have a a much safer and um, pedestrian accessible um, uh, pathway to their uh, venue. Um, so that is definitely going to be coming in 2021. If you go to the next slide, Madison. Um, and then the next one, yep. So we, um, like I said, for section one, these this, this part of the um, West Margin Way roadway improvements are still under consideration. We're still doing engagement for that. So section one, again, was either a no build or a, um, a two-way protected bike lane um, on, on that southbound outside curb lane. Um, and then if you go, uh, this is what that would look like. Um, you know, we did look at different options for how that bike connectivity could work. We heard in the Reconnect West Seattle survey that, um, you know, the, we, this is a missing gap between the West Seattle um, Bridge Trail and the Duwamish River Trail. And we do have um, a little section uh, where it's not um, any kind of bike facility to really gain access to and make the connection between these two facilities. So the facility could look something like this. Um, you know, we've been hearing some concerns about the, the, the safety aspect of this if you're a northbound rider um, coming um, in the opposite direction of a southbound driver. So we are looking with our design team to see what um, safety and design features um, could help to ensure that people are feeling safe and comfortable if that bike project goes uh, forward. Um, if you go to the next slide. He, so that was section one of West Marginal Way, potential roadway improvement. Section two is really where we're looking to see what else could we do. You know, some of the challenges we have in West Marginal Way is that um, the lanes uh, in the southbound direction start at one lane because that is our major choke point at the five-way intersection. Um, and going to or towards southbound, uh, towards southwest marginal place, it's just a one-lane 
roadway and then it splits into two and then it comes back to a one way one lane roadway um, at the uh, lane drop um, at Southwest Alaska Street and then it goes to a two lane road drop again, a two lane cross section for the southbound lanes. Um, so this is really about if, if we did build that uh, two way protected bike lane in section one, the orange line that you see on the map now, what do we do with that other space uh, in section two? So we're kind of looking at three different options. One could be an extension of that PBL or the trail connection to the longhouse uh, crossing signal that we're going to be installing. Another option could be um, extending on street parking um, so that there is some better business accessibility. Um, we know the Duwamish longhouse, if um, assuming not, not having events now, but if uh, as COVID recovery occurs, there might be more need for parking. Um, or the third option is to remove the lane drop and just remove the on-street parking from the longhouse. Um, so we will, we've um, already been assessing and having trade-offs um, uh, conversations between all three options. Um, so this is something that we're still continuing to look at and really um, uh, getting out to the public in a lot of different venues about um, listening to the community about uh, what their thoughts are on this project. If you go to the next slide, Matthew. Um, one big thing that we are doing um, is that there will be an open house that we would love you guys to come to on February 18th from 6 to 7.30. Um, that will be where we show um, a lot of the data and analysis that we have behind the project. Uh, we did a very long uh, presentation to the Seattle Freight Advisory Board. Um, Maybe, two, maybe a Tuesday or two ago. Um, and it will be more of that kind of information about the data analysis, the um, you know, speed studies that we've looked at and, and the design work that we've done. Um, in addition to what you see here, we, we have committed to doing a, a, some such presentation to the uh, Maritime Town Hall. We've set up a Maritime Town Hall when the uh, West Island Bridge closed. And we really wanna make sure we're getting a lot of the uh, voices from any businesses that are either along West Margin Way or definitely use it uh, to travel um, between their destinations. Um, the open house will actually be a virtual open house, Larry. So we will be sending out um, an invite, um, I think probably on WebEx or some virtual system that the city uses. Um, so we've been doing um, some door-to-door -door contact, which really means phone calls and emails at this time, but we really may have to go door-to-door -door soon here. Um, and we're going to try to um, get to a lot of community meetings. We're going to be sending out a mailer to a, a, a pretty wide swath of uh, West Seattle to make sure that they understand that this project is out there and we're really looking for uh, public comment at this time. In terms of the um, decision making, we do think that by early to uh, end of March, uh, at the end, by the end of quarter one, we should have a decision memo for our SDOT leadership, and then we'll see how um, that decision is made and if and what the project, uh, we still are trying to commit to delivering that project in 2021, as we kind of get further and further um, away from quarter one, that gets harder and harder to do as this project will then have to go into further design, and then to get in, in the queue for construction. So we still intend to build that project in 2021, and we'll just have to kind of wait and see and be nimble about what the outcome and the decision actually is on that. If you go to the next slide, Madison, we have a lot of Vision Zero yard signs that we um, uh, ordered from the uh, beginning of when the bridge was um, um, closed. Um, and so if, if you have any requests or you're feeling like your neighborhood streets are um, uh, receiving too much traffic or high speeds, we are more than happy to send some yard signs out to you. Um, they're available in different languages. And if you send an email request to westsalebridge at seattle.gov, we can help and deliver some yard Yard signs to you guys. Um, I will talk about the Low Bridge Automated Enforcement in just a one slide tonight, and we will come back and talk about it more um, at your next meeting if you would like us to, where we'll have more information and data from the start of photo enforcement. Um, as you guys might know, uh, photo enforcement began on July 11th, uh, July, that is not right, January 11th. Um, we've been in it for about two weeks. Uh, we're very much looking forward to some of the more detailed uh, data behind it, like an association with who, what user authorized 
authorize users are using the bridge, how often. Um, so we're still uh, working with the vendor with that kind of data and we're excited to start to do the analysis of, okay, how, how is the bridge capacity looking? What does it look like for the future? How are we gonna assess if more users can um, use that bridge at this time? As a reminder, anytime you go across that bridge, if you're not a freight vehicle, transit or emergency or an authorized user, you will get a $75 citation um, for each trip. Um, like Trevor was uh, mentioning in, in his portion of the presentation, we are monitoring traffic data, and this bridge is a definitely huge part of the transportation network at this time, even with, with those um, access restrictions. So it's very important for us to make sure we're looking at um, the traffic and volumes data um, as a whole um, for that construction, um, for, for these impacts and in, in data in the future. Um, so we do have a couple of different user groups that are, are authorized at this time, and uh, what we're working on right now for a potential next user group is the on-call healthcare providers, which is something that we've been hearing uh, quite a lot about um, from, from our stakeholders um, and the need to try to make sure, especially during these COVID times um, where healthcare providers are working some, some very long hours and how do we help support um, how they're getting to and from work if they live in West Seattle and potentially work across that waterway. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, I'm going to pass this back to Trevor. Um, he's really uh, a key point person in working uh, in conjunction with WashDOT on their upcoming work on the First Avenue Bridge. All right. So as you guys know, obviously, WashDOT has some work to repair work to do to the bridge. Um, just some highlights about it. Uh, they have a tentative start date in early March, um, and it's not any more defined than that. But as soon as WashDOT has firm dates, they will, um, they will announce them. Um, this project is uh, 15, uh, expected to last 15 days. Um, it'll include nightly lane closures, lane closures on the southbound bridge and including up to four overnight complete closures of the southbound bridge. Um, so that's between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. for those closures. Um, there will also be two periods where they do uh, two lane closures. So they'll do the right two lanes in one uh, one period and then they'll do the left two lanes in another, uh, another period of time. So that'll leave two southbound lanes open during that work. Um, and you'll note that uh, I said for up to 15 days, but uh, they're really working on refining that. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll get down, I think it's going to be, you know, possibly one uh, extended weekend. So four to or five to six day closure, and then the other one will be on a on just a, a single weekend. Um, so Washout has already posted uh, maps of alternative routes using um, some of the bridges that we talked about here tonight and also some other bridges uh, a little further south as well. So um, this project uh, that Washout is working on at this time, it does not impact the northbound 99 uh, Duwamish River Bridge. And um, yeah, so this is, this is coming up and just something to be prepared for um, as, uh, as you guys plan your trips in, uh, in March. And that's all I have. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Um, <clears throat> we are running a bit over, um, so I don't know that we'll have lots of questions. Um, folks should uh, get things into the chat window, and we'll make sure to pass them to our guests. Um, I see no Pete Spaulding has been waiting patiently there with his hand raised, um, so we'll let him ask a question. But before we get to that, um, I have two. We, we've gotten a few inquiries in uh, prior to the meeting on two issues that I want to raise. Um, one is a clarification. They're both low bridge access. One is a clarification that the official announcements out there seem to suggest that um, transportation network companies, so the Ubers and Lyfts uh, and things like that, are, are banned from the low bridge at all times. And I wanted to clarify if that's correct, because some of the language out there suggests that. And then uh, the other question, um, along with uh, the on-call hospital workers, um, there, there's a lot of questions about why we can't just allow motorcycles across. Mm. Um, I'm assuming we don't have huge thousands of people on motorcycles. Um, so it's something that <coughs> obviously we don't need to input into the cameras um, because cameras can identify right away a motorcycle um, and no need to worry about clogging up traffic um, in an emergency or freight problems. And so those yeah, are two things I wanted to bring up. Um, uh, Michael, I'll say from the TNC perspective, um, yes, TNCs, um, 
Uh, Madison, might, Ma Madison might jump in here too, but TNCs um, are able to use the bridge between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. as just as everyone else is able to use that bridge. Um, at this time, TNCs cannot use the bridge um, because they are not an authorized user during the day. Uh, motorcycles is an interesting one, Michael. Um, that would be something that we'll have to come back and bring to our low bridge access policy subcommittee. We're not introducing new user groups at this time as we're really taking the next couple months to assess um, uh, who's using the group at, at, if they're authorized users now outside of that healthcare provider um, uh, user group. But at, with the um, low bridge access subcommittee, um, we are going to continuously uh, take input on who is and who it does not have access and if there's ways um, that we can accommodate more. But at, at this time, we are pretty much sticking to our um, kind of cap of 450 trips um, each direction per day of that um, low bridge in, in coordination with um, upcoming T5 and making sure that we're not going to oversaturate that bridge prior to T5 starting and then having to restrict people. So we are being quite conservative of with the number at this time for um, how many people do have the capabilities and authorization to use that low bridge for on purpose. Um, but there are there are definitely things that we can discuss with our low, our low bridge subcommittee um, as we head in, into the future here. All right, Pete, get ready to ask your question. Um, but I'll ask one more quick clarification, Sarah, because I know sure. there's been some confusion out there. Okay. Um, when we're talking about the healthcare workers, mm -hmm. uh, correct, we're not talking about regular everyday commuting. We are not. We're talking about all. folks who are on call, like doctors, correct. nurses, anesthesiologists who get a page and are expected to show up quickly to do a surgery or some other intervention. Yeah, within a half hour is kind of our, we're, we're in the process of making that user group criteria with the Low Bridge subcommittee right now and really working with the healthcare providers to better understand what should the criteria be for the people that do have authorized use over that low bridge. It is definitely not for commuting um, and we would we would have to have a um, uh, um, like a I don't know what the, it's called, like a, just a piece of paper that shows that they were on call at that time. So we're really trying to work with hospital administration right now to really get a better sense of the number of people that would live in West Seattle and actually qualify to be part of that user group. Um, is We don't know if that number is like 50 people or 150 people or 3,000 people, you know. Um, so it's really important for us to have a better understanding of those numbers before we allow that access because we just don't know yet. So we're working on a healthcare um, uh, survey to go out um, this week, we have people, uh, two people on our low bridge subcommittee that also have healthcare uh, connections. So we are, are there in healthcare. Um, so we're trying to use a couple different methods to try to figure out what that number is for all the hospitals or clinics that may have on call um, need. So it will take us a little bit more time to try to figure that user group out for sure. All right, thank you. Pete Spalding, you're up and then we'll move on yeah. to our next guests. I have a I have a question about the the radar feedback signs and sure. just curious if there is any data that shows that they actually work you know to for the money that's being spent on these radar signs because if you drive down West Marginal Way and do the speed limit yeah you're going to be in a wreck I mean somebody's going to run over you and yeah. so I'm just curious if if it's well spent money and if there's any data that shows that they actually serve a purpose. Oh yeah, we definitely have, even the, um, Pete, even the um, radar feedback signs that we'd installed in 2020, we have done our um, our post uh, our, uh, studies. And so we do have numbers and we'll definitely show them at our open house on the 18th of February for the West Marginal Way. Trevor, do you have, being our, our engineer in, in house right now, do you have any other answers for Pete at this time? Yeah, I'll just say uh, we are doing before and after studies um, while you, you know, um, we're hoping for a larger decrease, you know, in speeds. Um, it is reflecting um, that there is some, you know, a, a drop in speed because of the radar speed signs. So, um, but, you know, we do hear your concerns and I know Mark uh, expressed similar concerns before about uh, West Marginal Way specifically, but um, yeah, they, they do have an impact, but, um, you know, they are, you know, and obviously uh, with time, as people get more used to them, um, they have a varying degree of, um, you know, uh, continual success. So, um, yeah, that's, um, that's what we'll say about that. 
Pete, um, I'll get you, I can have uh, James Lee, who is our lead for those radar feedback signs and see if you have uh, specific questions, if you have uh, specific areas that you want us to take a look at or you want to know what that uh, after study was. So you can- no, I, my, my point was, was that do they work? Because in the times that I've driven down marginal way, if you're not going 40 or 45, you're holding traffic up. Yeah, and that, that's part of the reason why we are looking at a roadway uh, redesign on that because um, the actual um, narrowing of, of that space would slow people down. Uh, we kind of um, see that in all of our studies. So that is one of the reasons why we are looking towards doing something different, at least with one of the, one of the lanes in that um, roadway because of the high speeds that we are experiencing. And the six uh, radar feedback signs that we have put up, um, we have seen some lower speeds, but um, maybe not at that 35 mile an hour speed limit. Sarah, this is Deb Barker. I'm gonna just jump in and ask on top of Pete's question regarding this enforcement where you have cameras where people mm. uh, make every effort to go much faster than that flashing sign. Uh, and my question to you earlier was, is there coordination between the sign installation and SDOT uh, monitoring and enforcement. Sorry, not SDOT, um, S SPD. Uh, really SPD, sorry. Um, I'm aware that the uh, flashes on Sylvan Way or no one was obeying those uh, police route yesterday, making a lot of money by issuing tickets. What sort of coordination is there between these flashing signs that no one's obeying and uh, the police who could uh, cite them. Thank mm -hmm. you. I'll just say that there is coordination. Um, early, uh, early on, SPD was out there on West Marginal Way um, doing some enforcement as well. Um, but we are um, working with SPD to highlight the fact that we're putting these in. And, um, you know, um, you know, I know they get a lot of requests and we're, we're trying to um, we're trying to fit in with their program as well and um, and and work with them on these uh, these locations. All right. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much, Trevor and Sarah. Um, I'm sure we'll see you again uh, this year. Um, uh, unfortunately, as I said, we, we are running behind, so I'm going to keep us moving and getting to our main guests. Um, if you do have questions, again, please drop them in the chat window. We'll make sure to get them to Sarah and Trevor um, and see. I know a lot of you, so I could probably get back to you with their responses, or we'll make sure to have them uh, be prepped to talk about it at our, uh, you know, someone from SDOT at least to talk about it at our next meeting. Um, but uh, continuing on here, um, just a reminder, if you haven't checked it out, um, there is an informational online open house, uh, which Sound Transit launched uh, at the end of last year. Um, which features an overview of the environmental review process along with detailed maps, elevation profiles, and descriptions of each alternative currently being studied. You can find all of that um, at the web address that's there on the screen. And I'm sure our guests will be sharing some of the slides and talking with us more about that. Um, if you need to come back and get that, ask in the chat or it'll be available in the video later. Um, and I will move us along to our conversation with Sound Transit. Um, with us tonight, again, many folks who uh, we've gotten to know well over the last few years, uh, but we have Lita, who's the Government and Community Relations Manager for the Central Corridor. Um, I believe we have Jason Hampton, the High Capacity Transit Development Manager. Um, I know I saw Cahill Ridge join us, who's the Executive Corridor, Corridor Director. We have Matt Sheldon, who's the Deputy Executive Director of Planning Integration. And then we also have uh, Sarah Maxana and uh, Sam Stork with the City of Seattle, in case there are some things that come up um, in terms of city coordination with Sound Transit. Um, and without further ado, I believe, Lita, you're going to be showing uh, slides. I sure am. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pull these. It's great to see everybody. Um, and um, on a nice regular interval, and thank you for sharing information about our online open house. We do hope to go over a little bit of that today. So um, our agenda, just building off of what um, Michael has shared, we're going to start by giving you an update on the West Seattle and Ballard Link Extensions project. So our uh, timeline, a little overview, reminder of what we're studying in the draft EIS or environmental review, as well as updates on uh, costs. 
We'll then um, turn it over to uh, Matt, who's joined us tonight to do a, a briefing on program realignment, which folks may have heard about. And then we hope, uh, we know we've got a lot to cover, but we hope to have some time for Q&A um, and, uh, and any next steps. So with that, um, so as folks may be well aware, but we've got this Sound Transit 3 um, voter proof package in 2016 that is really a regional investment um, when all builds out, it'll be a 116 mile network across the Puget Sound uh, by 2041. And it includes the West Seattle and Ballard link extension. So projects we um, often come and talk with you about. Um, just a little highlight though, we've got a lot under construction right now. Um, so in Northgate opening this year, we'll have three stations opening, Hilltop Tacoma, um, East Link 10 stations, um, all told, we'll have 28 light rail stations um, built and opening between 2021 and 2024. So a lot of progress and all of this is currently underway. Um, turning to the West Seattle and Ballard link extensions, just a reminder of our overall project timeline. There might be a couple of new things here for folks as well. So we are here um, in planning in the green, um, which goes from 2017 to 2023. Uh, for those folks with an eagle eye, it used to say 2022, so just flagging that. And then after planning, we go into design from 2023 to 2027 and construction from 2026 to 2036. Um, there is more detailed information specifically related to West Seattle and to Ballard. These are two extensions that we do the planning for together. Um, and then you'll note that the West Seattle extension is uh, opening 2031 and Ballard in 2036. Um, that used to be 2030 and 2035. We uh, are looking at a little bit of um, a delay there based on uh, additional time that we're taking in our environmental work during the planning phase, largely stemming from the pandemic, those delays. And these dates are based on planning timelines that of course are subject to change pending the board's realignment conversations, which we'll talk about more shortly. Zooming in on the planning phase, um, we've come here and talked with you quite a bit during the alternatives development phase. We had a stakeholder advisory group, an elected leadership group, and, um, and lots of neighborhood meetings and neighborhood forums. And I know Deb's here, who was on our stakeholder advisory group. Um, we are studying the alternatives that the board identified, uh, preferred alternatives and other alternatives back in 2019 in an environmental review process. The next big milestone coming up ahead of us is in mid-2021 where we expect to publish the draft EIS. We will have a public comment period. And after that comment period, our board will confirm or modify uh, the preferred alternatives. And then in 2023, we expect to publish the final EIS after which the board will select the project to be built and uh, we'll have our federal record of decision. So we've got a little ways ahead of us in planning. And just a, a reminder of what we are studying um, in this phase, we are looking at multiple routes and station options in the draft EIS, including preferred alternatives and preferred alternatives with third party funding. You'll see preferred alternatives in pink, preferred alternatives with third party funding in brown. And then we are also studying other alternatives in the draft EIS. We study all of these alternatives equally. Um, the notion of a preferred alternative just makes clear to the public where the project is headed, it indicates a preference, but it's not um, considered a final decision or obligation. Um, so I did want to um, just share a little bit about how Sound Transit and the City of Seattle are working together. And I've got um, a couple of my colleagues here from the City of Seattle to present with me. So I'll just kick it off and explain a little bit about Sound Transit's role. Um, so we evaluate the uh, alignment, potential alignment and station locations. We conduct the planning, environmental review and design the light rail system. And then we build and operate the new light system. And then Sam. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sam Stork. I work in the Seattle Department of Neighborhoods on the Sound Transit Project among some others as well. The role that the city of Seattle plays um, in this is that we have two voting members on the Sound Transit Board to make final decisions. And that is, <clears throat> our mayor, Jenny Durkin, and then council member, Deborah Juarez, who's in the northern part of Seattle. Um, the other parts that we do, we plan housing and businesses and open spaces to make sure these are integrated and, and um, well-used stations in our neighborhoods. We also issue the permits to Sound Transit to build stations and tracks. 
The areas that Sound Transit and the city work together um, is on centering racial equity for better outcomes and co-planning with communities. And so what does that co-planning look like? Um, for myself, I'm not a planner, I'm a social worker. And so this is this diagram I think is extraordinarily helpful, right? Sound Transit, that area is, a, the box is the station itself. Um, the station context is kind of the one to three streets around, or one to three blocks kind of around the station area. And then the area where the city does a lot of its work is really this kind of, some people talk about it as a walk shed, maybe 10 minutes around the station, but just this larger area um, and this is again where we think about how it's better integrated into our city's neighborhoods. Oh, there we go. Um, some of the ways that we, when we really want to come out with Sound Transit, knowing that there's a lot of different topics, but just introduce and and, um, and make sure folks know that the city is doing some of this work internally and in partnership with the city. Um, so we are working on strong relationships to identify early issues and craft solutions with Sound Transit. Um, we internally, we have teams around permitting and planning and public engagement. Um, and that is to really make sure again, that we're able to identify issues and craft solutions. We're working to support delivering it faster and within budget. And they're also collaborating with Sound Transit on a racial equity toolkit to make sure uh, we center uh, issues of race. And this is one of the first times that two city, um, two city or sorry, government agencies, uh, we're so much with y'all, I think, anyway. but. Um, uh, two government agencies have worked on a racial equity toolkit together, which I think is really powerful and just shows um, the importance of community. Uh, this summer, um, around the time that COVID hit, we had a guiding principles survey that was out. Um, and the things that we heard from it were uh, the importance of equity, dependable transit, vibrant communities, and climate action as being important strategies in this work for the city of Seattle. Um, we know that, that this hit during the time when COVID was, um, was initially coming up. And so uh, we'll continue to, um, to really hone in on these areas with community as we are doing our engagement um, during the COVID era and in the hopeful post-COVID era when it comes to this project. Um, but we are really committed to some community in this work as a city as well. Sorry, trying to find my unmute. Thank you, um, Sam. I am going to go ahead and um, we're going to actually go to our participate online site um, for this next piece. There it is. Do folks see that on the screen? Yep. Okay, great. <laughs> it's always wonderful when it all works. Okay, so um, so uh, uh, Michael shared the link with you all, WSB link. Um, Dot participate dot online. And what we wanted to do, while we have so much else that we would like to also cover, we thought we could um, point out to you this resource um, and just uh, help give you a sense of sort of what you can come back to later and dig in on. And of course, any of this, we would be happy to come back and spend a lot more time with you on. So I have bookmarked this myself just because um, we put a lot of work into trying to have all these resources available digitally, especially during uh, COVID, having that resource available for people we hoped would be good uh, during this time period. So what you'll see across the top here is that we do have um, this website uh, available in multiple languages beyond Google Translate. You can click one of these links up here. It's also e-reader friendly. We have multiple sections here. There's a welcome to give you what's the latest. You can look at all of what's sort of understanding about what's going on in environmental review, what's an environmental impact statement. You can take a look at the alternatives and explore those as well as all of the station locations. And if you have an idea for how to stay engaged with us or would like to request a briefing, there is, um, there's a tab for you for that as well. We also have just a, a disclaimer here to sort of help people kind of understand what else is going on in terms of how COVID-19 might impact the project. There's a handy link to our realignment page on there as well. Um, so scrolling down, I'm gonna do this pretty briefly and then hand it over to Jason to talk about the alternatives briefly that we're studying in the station so you know where to find that information. But um, what's the latest here? Um, we'll just highlight uh, some key things in terms of what the BitNext big milestone is. So as we talked about, it's when we publish the draft environmental impact statement in mid-2021. You'll see that um, some of these terms are defined. So there's a little pop-up, which is kind of handy. Um, so scrolling on down here too. So we have information about what is 
in what is an environmental impact statement and then also how you can engage in that. So really wanting to make sure that folks are thinking about commenting later this year. Uh, we also talk about equity and inclusion during environmental review, so our environmental justice analysis, as well as that racial equity toolkit uh, that Sam mentioned. We have the project timeline available for folks. And then uh, additionally here, for folks that um, are really interested to see what is it that we're going to be looking at in the environmental uh, document, and so what can you hope to, to look at and understand about the projects and all the alternatives when it is published, we've got a section on the natural environment. If you press that, you can see all the different types of things we're looking at, the built environment and transportation. And then I'm gonna go here um, to the alternatives. And given where we are, we'll go on um, these pink buttons. You can click on any of them. We'll go to West Seattle. And Jason, if you would like to tell us just a little bit about what we're looking at here, that would be great. Yeah, thank thanks Lita, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, thanks for walking through the site there. I'm just gonna provide a quick tour of the alternatives to the stations on the site. So the first thing shown here is a, a map uh, of the West Seattle link extension. Um, it's showing all of the alternatives in the station locations. So as we know, in, in the case of West Seattle, we're studying various alignments across the Duwamish, a number of station locations and routes in Delridge, and then both elevated and tunnel stations in Avalon and Alaska Junction. And then if you scroll down below the overview map, there are three segment headers. So you see Duwamish, Dell Ridge, and Alaska Junction there. And then when you expand on these, it shows the descriptions of alternatives being studied in each segment. So each includes a map of the alignment. Uh, we show a cross section that details the height of the key features. So in this case, you see the clearance of the crossing over the Duwamish waterway, the West waterway. And then it also uh, provides a short description of the alternative. And then similarly, if you click on, Lita, do you mind clicking on Delridge? Just show one with some stations. Thanks. So here again, we have a, a description, a written description. We have a map showing the alternative and station location. And in the profile, which shows the station height. And in this case, we also show the height of the guideway at its tallest point along Delridge. Um, and these descriptions are available for Delridge, but if you click on the Alaska Junction section, you also find similar information for Avalon and Alaska Junction stations. So in the interest of time, um, I'm gonna move on a little bit. So also available on the site are more detailed descriptions of the station areas. So first you'll find a description of what we consider when we look at the stations. I think you might. So if you wanna hover over that, Lita, a little bit down. So, so here, we, uh, what we consider, um, and then also, we can close that one there, um, how we partner with the city. You heard a little bit about that from Sam, but we also have some descriptions here, some illustrations of the same graphics that Sham, Sam was showing there. And scrolling down a little bit further, and, and Lita showed you these links before, but uh, we have links to all of the stations. Um, and if we click on one, I'm gonna just choose Alaska here to uh, kind of take you through and show you what's on there. We have, uh, all of the stations in the Alaska Junction. So if we click on the elevated Fauntleray Way Station, for an example, thanks. And then we have uh, five different maps here that show different items related to station context. So this first one shows um, the just simply the station location, a little bit more zoomed in than the other descriptions, uh, provides a short description of what the station context. And then uh, we can go on to the next one by clicking the arrow there. We also um, have cross sections here. And in the cross sections, we include elevated uh, stations only, not the, not the tunnel stations, but they show key features such as entrance locations, elevators and escalators, proximity to nearby roadways. And it also shows an approximate height at both the station platform and in the top of the station elements. So the next one to the right. So this, this graphic details on station entrance locations. Uh, showing here, it starts and uh, has a text description of where those locations are at the top right. So those stars there. And then just quickly, we'll go to the next one to the right. And this shows, oh, I think we went one too fast, sorry. Sorry, Lita. So this one shows uh, pedestrian access. No, we're good, sorry. One more, sorry, Lita. And then bike access. So th this has a description of, of how people would access the station by bicycle. It also shows existing bike routes and planned bike routes. 
and then it has the uh, the station location and then proposed locations of bike storage at the station locations. Next one. And then it additionally shows transit access. So we show proposed transit routes where stop locations would be, uh, again, with the description there at the top right. And then the last one. We circle back to the start. So, well, I just went through this pretty quickly. Um, as Lita scrolls down, you'll see that we do this for every station location in the Alaska Junction. And if you backed out, you could click on this for Delridge or really any of the stations on the entire West Seattle and Ballard Link extensions. So Lita, if you wanna add anything there, uh, feel free to, otherwise we'll, uh, we'll move on the presentation uh, for Kale to talk a little bit about the cost estimate update. Jason, this is Deb, can I ask you a quick question? Please. Sure, you just showed a map and it, uh, the Fauntleroy, uh, the Alaska Junction Fauntleroy elevated. And did I see that you were using old base maps? It is possible, yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, we're missing Whole Foods, uh, Whitaker. Uh, I can't believe you're using old base maps. Crap, thanks. Sorry. That's in my be for a while. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Deb. <laughs> um, all right, we'll go ahead and stop sharing this. Share our next, go back to the presentation. So that was the, um, the online site. I'm gonna turn it over to Cahill to talk about capital cost estimate updates for projects in development. Uh, yeah, Lita, can you hear me? I can. Great. So um, I'll talk a little bit about this. Earlier this month, I think you may, you may be aware, staff gave the board a capital cost estimate update for projects in development. And I'll speak a little bit to that now in a moment in a bit more detail as it relates to the West Seattle and Ballard project. Um, but before I jump into that, I just wanted to um, make you aware, and this really builds on something that Lita outlined at the start of the presentation. Current construction projects are not affected. This is really about projects that are in the early stages of development. So this review of capital costs really just applies to projects that have not yet been baselined, that are not in final design, not at the 60% design level or in construction. These are for projects that are in the early stages of project developments, uh, like West Seattle Ballard and, and a number of other projects in the ST3 program. So, you know, we have seven or eight projects right now that are currently in, in construction, under budget and on schedule, and, and that's not changed by any of the information that I'm going to uh, share with you. And as Lita noted, um, by 2024, right now we're on track to triple the overall light rail system from 22 to 62 miles. Again, what I'm about to present to you doesn't affect that. Um, but we have some of the issues that we are seeing uh, in project development right now in the early stages of project development. We did see these, these same pressures recently when we baselined the budgets for the Linwood Link and Federal Way Link extensions uh, just before they went into construction. Um, next slide, please, Lita. Um, another little bit of information. Um, when we developed the ST3 plan costs back in 2014, 2015, uh, we did have an expert review panel. And the purpose of that expert review panel was to really review the technical work, the methodologies. And as noted there, these are a couple of observations that they made back in 2015 timeframe. And they noted that the level of allowances, contingencies and reserves at this very early stage of planning and design is appropriate and that the capital cost estimating methodology is sound and consistent with good industry practice. Um, but they also noted that it's important to recognize that at this stage that you know, before projects go, go to the ballot that we haven't done the environmental work and a lot of the cost estimating is, is difficult to do with, with, with precision. And that's, that's what we're experiencing right now as we've been going through the environmental work. And I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit more as I get into the discussion of the West Seattle Ballard cost estimates in particular, um, but that's what I'll focus on today. Um, next slide, please, Lita. Um, as Lita mentioned up front, we, we have a number of alternatives we're looking at in the draft EIS. Um, for the sake of simplicity right now, I'm just gonna focus on the preferred alternative. Um, so ne next slide. 
So here are the changes in the cost estimates that we're seeing. And these all numbers are in millions of dollars, 2019 dollars. And if you look at the top row here for the preferred alternative, and this assumes the elevated Fauntleroy Way Station in West Seattle, the cost increase from when we did the estimate a couple of years ago to where we are today, went from about $8 billion to about $12 billion overall for the entire project. And that's about $4 billion increase, over 50%. You're just looking at West Seattle to downtown, the second row there, cost went from about 1.8 to $3.1 billion, about $1.3 billion increase overall. Uh, Ballard to downtown, uh, you can see again, the cost increasing. Um, I'm seeing a pop up in front of me, so I can't actually see the numbers, but 3.5 to 5.3 or, so, or so billion dollars, another 53% increase. And again, a similar increase for the downtown light rail tunnel. So generally you can see that we've had a very large increase as we've been uh, evolving the project through the environmental process and getting updated cost estimates. And I'm gonna explain a little bit about, about why we're seeing that, what's, what's driving these cost increases overall. Next slide, please, Lena. So again, at the top there, you see the, the cost change from our prior estimate a couple of years ago to where we are today. And so what has really changed? What's driving that overall increase? Um, the first bullet there, that's really the big thing. We've had a over $2 billion increase in right-of-way acquisition. And as noted there, it's to do with newer commercial multifamily developments and, and other factors, which I'll get into in a moment. We've had about a $1.27 billion increase or so in construction costs. Again, I'll get into that in more detail. We're talking about larger aerial guideways than we'd assumed, higher station costs, and now we've got a much better understanding of utilities and environmental work. And then the third category there is soft costs and contingencies. Those are, those are percentages at this stage of project development. So when you see the right-of-way costs increase or the construction costs increase, then the percentage uh, number would then result in the soft costs and contingencies also increasing. So I'm not going to spend time on soft costs and contingencies. I'll speak mostly to the right-of-way and construction costs. Um, next slide, please, Leah. Right of way, um, fairly, fairly straightforward to understand, I guess, in a way, even though it's a very large number, we've seen uh, what, 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 essentially what we've, what we've learned, if you like, over the last couple of years, or what we've seen is just a lot of new development throughout the corridor. I'm, I'm sure we're all, we're all seeing that, and as Deb noted in the previous, previous comment there, uh, it's hard to keep our base maps updated. <laughs> it's changing all the time. Um, and, uh, and that new development is happening throughout the corridor. We're also seeing a much higher rate of real estate appreciation than, than we had anticipated. Um, you know, assessment of a one year increase, we're seeing for some of those high value properties is more in the range of about 21%. We've been assuming overall in our financial plan about an annual 6.5% increase. So it's, it's appreciating a lot faster than we had anticipated back in the ST3 planning days. And then also, as we've been going through project development, um, we've got a much better understanding of what our right-of-way needs actually would be. I and mean, in the early planning stages, as you know, uh, this group certainly knows, we look at lots of different alternatives, lots of different alignments. Um, we don't have design at that point in time. We're making assumptions um, based on planning level assumptions of what our right-of-way needs might be. But over the last couple of years, as we've been doing the environmental re review work, um, we're able to do an actual design We've got a much better understanding of what property we really would require both for construction and operation. And uh, therefore that's also increasing the amount of right of way we would need. Um, next slide, please. Uh, these are some of the increases in the construction costs and I'm gonna get into uh, more detail on each of these things, but just initially at a high level, um, what we've learned over the last couple of years, we've done, first of all, a lot of early field work and design work and as noted there, we're seeing a need for wider, longer spans, larger fast shafts and foundations and straddle vents um, and, and, and other tunnel rated elements. And I'll give you some examples of those in a moment. We've also done a lot of advanced station planning. This is work that you can't do early on, but as we've been going through the last couple of years and we have our alternatives to look at, we can really dig into those stations. We've done, as you know, a lot of work with the community to understand what would be required in those station areas. Um, so we're seeing additional costs for stations, uh, for station entrances, additional elevators, escalators, pedestrian walkways, all that sort of stuff is getting clarified and the cost of it better understood. We've done a lot of early utilities investigation, so we've got a better understanding of the scope and extent of those utilities uh, throughout the corridor. And then the big thing that we're doing right now is, is environmental study, obviously. Um, so we're really getting a better understanding of the potential environmental 
impacts, we're able to quantify those impacts in a way that we couldn't before. And because now we can quantify them, we also got a better idea of what the mitigation costs would potentially be for those impacts. So those are the main cost drivers. And I'll just speak to each one of these right now. Um, Lita, if you can move to the next slide, thanks. Uh, so just focusing on the first bullet, um, the field work and design, and uh, you can see these are numbered. Uh, so I'll go through them in order. Uh, firstly, number one there, you see pointing to the Duwamish crossing area. You'll also see it on the right of the screen pointing to the inner bay, kind of Salmon Bay area. Um, and we're just seeing in that area larger, the need for larger, deeper foundations. And this is based on a lot of geotechnical work that we've done um, just all throughout the corridor. But in these particular areas, we're understanding that our, our foundations would be, need to be a lot deeper than, than we would have understood before now. And so that's driving up the costs. And number two there, it's pointing to straddle bents and long spans. This is in the Spokane Street corridor. It's also true in the Delridge area. Um, these are areas where, it, as you know, um, there's a lot of activity in these areas, a lot, of, a lot of port use, a lot of marine facilities, a lot of businesses, a lot of infrastructure in general. Um, so we can't always put the columns directly under the guideway like you would ideally do. In many cases, we have to have a, what we call a straddle bend, essentially a structure that spans over the roadway or whatever facility it is we're trying to avoid. And then you put the guideway on top of that structure and that's driving up the cost the more we understand about the constraints in that area. Uh, if you move down to the bottom of the screen there, um, I'm not seeing the, the full bottom of the screen for some reason there. I'll just see if I can adjust. Oh yeah, that's a little bit better. Um, and the number three there is the, um, in the Soto area in particular, um, we're having additional excavation support needed. Again, this is due to geotechnical borings in that area. Um, and it's really revealing the need for um, stronger, more, more robust excavation support due to due to soil conditions. In the Midtown area, we're needing to add an additional crossover. Um, for those who are not familiar with crossover, those are um, where, you, where the train can move from one track to another track. You need those crossovers to avoid, uh, to allow the service to function in the event of an incident where perhaps a train is disabled or there's some other incident. Um, and as we went through the phase one process and uh, we moved our tunnel portal south, we also um, identify the need for additional crossovers in the downtown area. Um, number five speaks to uh, tunnel station boxes. Um, just to explain what I mean by that, um, as you know, in the downtown area, we're looking at tunnels and in the station areas, um, we'd be doing, uh, in these particular locations, we'd be doing cut and cover tunnels. And it's, if you've seen, if you've seen tunnel construction or station construction, um, it essentially looks like a box, a rectangular box. Um, and ideally you have the entrances for the station immediately adjacent to those boxes. But um, what has become challenging is in the downtown area, given, given the rate of development and so on and the properties in that area, it's very difficult to find a entrance location that's adjacent to the tunnel box itself. So you're having to have remote entrance locations and that's leading to uh, situations where we need to lengthen the length of the, of the station box itself. Um, numbers, one more, I think, number six, um, in, the, in the Smith Cove interbay area, if you like, um, we had anticipated uh, back in phase one that we'd be at grade along the BNSF tracks in that area. Um, but as we've been going through the design, we've discovered again, because of soil conditions that we can have our portal in that location, in the location that we'd anticipated. And that has changed our overall profile from being at grade to elevated in that area. So um, next slide, please, Lita. Um, this speaks to station planning. Again, um, as I mentioned, we've been doing a lot of advanced station planning work. Um, and this has resulted in uh, a number of things that we've had to change in our design work, our design assumptions up to, up to now. And number one there, you'll notice in the Soto area, we're, we are of course building a new station um, in that area. And we've also identified in the course of doing that work, the need for modifications to the existing station to allow for better transfers. In the downtown area and number two there, we're seeing the need for additional underground passages. And really this is again, to do with uh, what I was describing about access to the station. It's not always possible to get the access points where you would like them to be. Um, and then just to facilitate those transfers, particularly in the, in the you know, transfer stations in CID and Westlake area. Um, you just having to do longer underground passages to make that work. 
Um, number three there speaks to, again, that point I made about in the Smith Cove Interbay area where we have to move the guideway and as such the station from being at grade to elevated. And then number four just speaks to uh, what we've been learning about the need for additional elevators and escalators in a number of locations, as it, note, as it notes there, Soto, downtown, and uh, Smith Cove station areas uh, in, in particular. Um, next slide, please, Lita. Early utilities investigation. Um, again, as we've been doing the design, uh, we didn't have a design back in alternative development, um, but uh, as we've been doing design and understanding better uh, what our drainage needs are. And we've also been trying to identify where those uh, drainage detention vaults would be located. We can't really do surface detention in this corridor um, because it's it's obviously too built up. There aren't properties available or if they are available and um, they're very expensive. So we're having to do underground detention vaults. Finding places where those can be accommodated um, is, is challenging. Um, number two, in the Soto area, uh, we do would have to relocate a 230 kilovolt transmission line um, and we, we're aware of that, but as we've worked through that as well, we are, we're adding additional costs to accommodate that now that we have better understanding of what the re relocation requirements are. There's a utility corridor in the Chinatown ID area uh, that we need to relocate. Um, it's also a, a major 40 inch, eight inch deep utility along West Lake in the Denny station area that needs to be relocated. And then uh, over there on the right, number five, along 14th Avenue in Ballard, there's a stormwater outfall um, 96 inch stormwater outfall that would need to be relocated. So some major utilities um, that we've learned as we've been going through the project development. So it's good, good to identify these things early um, rather than have a surprise later on. Um, but right now, if you were to simply assume um, this alignment and these, these, these features, you, you would have to account for that in the cost estimate. Next slide, please. This is the last slide that I will go through related to cost elements itself, just kind of giving you examples. But environmental study is, of course, the big emphasis of what we're doing right now. As I mentioned, we're, we're out there doing a lot of field work um, and really identifying what the likely impacts are to for any of these alternatives that we're studying. Um, and so uh, coming out of that, we're able to quantify what those impacts are. We're able to quantify then what the mitigation would, would potentially cost. And as I noted there, you can see number one in the Duwamish area, and you see also number one on the right side of the page um, in the Salmon Bay area. It's speaking to ecosystems uh, impacts in those areas and, and the costs associated with that. Um, number two, which you've seen a, a few number twos across the corridor, you see there in the Duwamish area, we've identified archeological resources as we've been doing our surveys of, of potential archeological resources along the corridor. Similarly in the Chinatown, the downtown area in general, a lot of historic resources um, that we might uh, potentially impact. And similarly in the Ballard area over there on the right side of the screen, again, uh, archeological and historic resources um, that, that would need to be mitigated if we potentially affect those alternatives or those facilities. Um, Number three speaks to transportation impacts at the bottom of the screen there. Um, again, uh, you know, it's pointed to the Soto busway area where, as you know, um, we would be planning to use the existing Soto bus busway, which currently, uh, you know, is partly occupied by light rail, but we would also, the new line would also be going in there. There'll be some impacts associated with that, obviously. Um, so yeah, in the streetcar in the downtown area, we would have effects during construction that would need to be mitigated and also link light rail operations itself as we do cutovers and so on. And then the, the fourth item, the final item that I'll point out is just parks mitigation. Again, um, just we have a much better understanding now, given that we have alternatives that we could design and that we can assess the impacts of what the, we, you know, we can quantify what those impacts are. We can quantify what the mitigation would likely be. And you see that in the West Seattle area with the West Seattle golf course and the, and the green belt, the Duwamish green belt. You'll see it in the, uh, over there to the right near the Smith Cove area where you've got the Queen Anne slopes um, and then you've got a green belt area and you've got the Interbay Golf Center uh, athletic complex as well. All those facilities would be affected by the preferred alternative. Um, next slide, please, Lita. Um, so that, that was speaking to the preferred alternative. I, I do have a slide in here speaking to the other alternatives, the tunnel alternatives. As you know, uh, we had elevated alternatives in uh, the junction area, um, but we also, as part of the draft EIS process, evaluated tunnel alternatives. And this slide just gives you a quick snapshot of where we are 
in terms of our cost estimate assessment of, of both the elevated and the tunnel alternatives. You can see right now, and this is just looking at the, the Delridge and West Seattle segments of the project, the elevated Fauntleroy Way station location in pink there at the bottom cost to be about $1.6 billion. If you're looking at the other elevated preferred alternative in the junction, um, also in pink there in the top right, 41st, 42nd Avenue location, that'd be about $2 billion. And then you can see the tunnel alternatives either on 41st on 44 or on 42nd, those are coming in at about 2.1 or 2.2 billion dollars. Um, next slide, please, Lita. So um, next steps uh, on the cost estimates, and I'll, I'll hand it over to Matt in a second to get into the realignment stuff. Um, we have initiated a third-party independent review of the cost estimates and the methodologies. That, you know, given the size of the increase that we're seeing, we 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 do want to get feedback from an outside consultant. And, and then get their assessments of whether we're on the mark or whether they have any observations. So that, that independent review is underway and um, we will be uh, looking for the results of that effort. And we should get some initial feedback in April. And that independent review will support potentially further updates to the cost estimate and assumptions. We don't know yet, obviously, uh, what's gonna come out of that, but we, could, as we hope to learn more uh, and get some recommendations from that, which could inform um, our cost estimating assumptions and our methodologies for assessing cost um, moving forward as we, as we continue to progress project development. Uh, next slide, please. I think with that, I hand it over to Matt to, to talk through where we are with realignment. Good evening. I hope uh, you can hear and see me. Can we give me a high sign? Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, great. Thanks, Lita. Well, good, good evening. I'm Matt Sheldon. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for Planning and Integration at Sound Transit, and I'm helping staff our executive team and our board of directors on what we're calling the realignment process. And Cahill just got done talking about uh, costs in some detail specific to the West Seattle Ballard project. I'm going to broaden the conversation a little bit to what that cost impact is looking like uh, across the entire sound transit program and across our whole district and talk about kind of the revenue situation. And we're kind of seeing pressures in both areas that are uh, forcing us to need to take a look at the entire program and figure out how we might make changes to get it back into an affordable state. So next slide, please. So you may have seen something like this before, just a reminder for folks uh, of where Sound Transit's money comes from. Uh, you know, we're pretty heavily uh, tax dependent and much of that comes from uh, the sales tax. You also pay car tabs. Uh, we do have grants and fares that come in. We do have a small slice of the pie that uh, comes out of property tax. And then we do also have debt funding. We're able to go to the finance market and actually leverage our revenues uh, for additional borrowing. So just as a backdrop, uh, next slide, please. So we are seeing pressures in uh, both the cost and the revenue side. Not surprisingly, with uh, the pandemic, uh, we are experiencing an economic recession. And this started to become apparent not too long after um, the pandemic started last spring. And we spent much of last year sort of grappling with that and starting to set up this realignment process with the anticipation that you know, we really needed to solve that revenue equation. Uh, but of course, then late in the year, uh, this new information about higher costs began, began to come in and that has uh, exacerbated the situation. Um, I won't go into the details behind all of that, uh, but the same kinds of pressures that uh, Cahill was talking about for the West Seattle Ballard project, we are seeing across our entire program and other projects as well. Next slide. So uh, this is sort of the summary of what that means. Um, we are looking at about a $6 million loss in revenue in our financial plan uh, out through 2041 and about double that in cost increases. So there's over $18 billion worth of higher pressure on the finance plan, if you will. However, we do have some offsets for that. Uh, we do have some remaining debt capacity uh, with the higher costs, we are now also assuming higher grants uh, coming to the program. Uh, and there are a few other sources of revenue in the finance plan that help to bring that number down. But we're still in a situation where 
we're looking at about uh, an $11.5 billion affordability gap to build everything uh, that was promised to the voters in the SD3 program uh, on the same schedule. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, next slide, please. There are really uh, a few tools that are available to the board as they consider how to adjust the overall program to make it affordable again. So cutting costs is a big piece of that. Uh, they do have authority to reduce the project scopes, uh, which could include suspending or even canceling entire projects. But there are other options for cutting costs short of that in terms of taking a hard look at what are the elements of projects that are being included? Are there cheaper ways to build some of them? Are there certain elements that maybe um, could be either postponed or deleted, but still get as much benefit out of the project as possible? That, however, is you know not where anybody really wants to go first. There's lots of interest in, well, can we find additional money, uh, new revenues, uh, to be able to preserve as much of the program on its current schedule as possible? So you'll hear our board talking about uh, both of these things, but there's strong interest in uh, additional revenues. And I think there's some renewed optimism with the new uh, federal administration uh, that has just come into power uh, and their commitment to infrastructure investment across the nation. And we think there may be some possibilities there to bring some additional grants into the program, but you know, time will tell on that. Another major tool that they have, aside from looking at uh, cutting costs or raising new revenues, is we can uh, use time to our advantage. There are ways potentially to delay or phase projects over time uh, to get them back within the cash flow and the finance plan that is affordable. Uh, there are different uh, ways to adjust our debt capacity potentially. There uh, may be opportunities to uh, even increase our debt capacity limits. Some of those would require coming back to the voters. Next slide, please. So that was just a very quick uh, sort of thumbnail overview of kind of the challenges we're facing and the kinds of tools that the board has at its disposal. You know, this is gonna be uh, a difficult conversation uh, across the entire district. There are a lot of things at play here, but I wanted to give you a sense that you know, we are uh, approaching this in a systematic matter. Um, this is a, a kind of our, our best guess at the moment about how this will play out. Uh, as this became apparent uh, last year, the board last summer actually took some actions to set a schedule uh, and deadline for itself to try to make some decisions about how to realign the program. So this lays out kind of the steps to get there. At the moment, they are targeting uh, taking action on realigning the plans uh, by the middle of the summer. Uh, but there are some things we need to do to get there. And you can see those on the screen. I guess I would point out specifically, we are planning to be out for some public engagement uh, on alternatives and potential options, we hope, uh, here in the April timeframe. Um, I'll be honest, though, you know, the board is uh, feeling its way through this a bit, and this timeline could change a bit depending on where their conversation goes and, and how they want to approach this. So this is our best guess, but this is what we would like to try to achieve this year. So with that, let me stop and I'll turn it back over to Lita to help us field questions. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, so Kate, I see a handful of questions in the chat. And Michael, do we wanna take those now? I know we were a little behind on the agenda, so we're open to how you'd like to manage. Uh, you know, we are a little behind on the agenda, although I'll, I'll clarify our guests are within their allotted time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, as sort of our focus topic um, and, and sort of the light end of the agenda we have, um, I definitely want to keep us here at least for say, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so, so that folks can uh, ask their questions. And, you know, if we need to kick some of our, you know, membership discussion offline or to next month's meeting, um, uh, unless there are lots of objections in the chat, which I don't expect there to be. Um, I think, you know, if we need to go closer to 830 and the end of the meeting here, um, 
then that's what we'll do. I want to give everybody a chance to ask questions. Um, so please raise your hand um, and, and we'll we'll get to you or uh, add questions to the chat window. And I'll hand over to Kate to see um, if there's particular questions um, that have popped up that we think need to be asked. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion. So I'm going to try to filter through this for um, some questions that haven't been addressed. Um, so Michael, you were discussing um, station. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. I, th I think <laughs> good. Uh, I think Sam got back to me and maybe we've got okay. a, a good future guest idea there. Um, although while you're looking through there, I'll just uh, clarify Thank you. <laughs> um, for sort of the broader audience. Um, you know, the, there are ongoing uh, questions that have been raised um, over the last year or two. Uh, you know, looking at some of the sort of the, the early sound transit stations um, that maybe did not have the best integration into neighborhoods. Um, and then looking at some of the more recent stations that were added um, as it extended south into Federal Way um, that really uh, bring residential close by guideways or businesses tucked in next to and around stations. Um, and so there's a real question on the part, I think, of a number of our stakeholders, um, sort of where is the city going to fall? Because the city controls quite a bit of that zoning um, and what's allowed, and that's not really in sound transit's purview. And so we've really been trying to push the city to say, like, hey, you know, there's a big decision whether you want a, a route where presentially the guideway is in the street versus on the side of the street or 150 feet in the air versus maybe 70 feet in the air. Because if we're allowed to have development come in underneath or really close and next to, um, then that makes our neighborhoods look very different than if we need to have very large setbacks. Um, and suddenly that guideway and station is really just hanging out um, kind of all on its own up in the air. Um, or I think um, as another example, folks can imagine that, you know, if the light rail runs elevated up Avalon, uh, most people are not going to see that guideway because there are tall apartment buildings that have come in yeah. on the other side. Um, so. And so that really impacts view corridors and what sort of people feel light rail yeah. is doing as it comes through our neighborhoods. No, and, and Michael, this is Lita. So um, one thing I do, I just want to channel our station planning folks. And I know Sarah Maxana is on here and Sam Stark too from the city. We do have a lot of partnership that we're doing around that station planning. I know that um, many folks were involved in some of our early station planning work. It, it has been something as we've looked at ST3 that we want to do a lot more agency partner engagement. So we've been talking to King County Metro and um, and talking to even you know, our friends at the port, the city of Seattle very closely to try to really understand how these stations will, will integrate into neighborhoods, both from that city perspective, as well as how will they um, integrate with transit. And so what you saw on the online open house is kind of the first, here's where we are right now, um, but there will be, and I am remiss to have not mentioned it before, there will be much more visuals that will be released with the draft environmental impact statement. And I think it would be great as a follow up to follow up with our city partners and have sort of a station planning night. I know we kind of we sort of wanted to actually have that, but we've had a lot more information come online in terms of realignment and cost. So we wanted to share all of that. I see Deb's hand up. And you, I, I you know, I'll say really quick before Deb gets her question. Um, you know, I have been very lucky. Um, to, to participate in some more of the intense planning uh, early on that Sound Transit yeah. did um, as a neighborhood rep, which I really appreciate. Um, and, you know, in this kind of, while we're in this more Zoom virtual environment for everything right now, um, it might be great actually if we could consider doing some of that intense station area feedback, design envisioning things um, with a broader audience, because I think it would be much easier for people to pay it, uh, to participate. Uh, now, some of those barriers that we have when it's in person and during a workday have kind of gone away right now. Um, and maybe that's something, a way we can take advantage of this, uh, you know, yeah, pandemic so we that we're in follow right now. Up, talk to our city partners too and just see what we can kind of organize. Uh, this is Deb, and along those lines, I had a uh, chat with Sam, and I am encouraging uh, the city uh, to 
have this engagement be well before the draft EIS comes out. Don't wait. If you do wait, you're, in my opinion, making a stupid mistake. Um, engage the community now and have those dis discussions and talk about planning area and station area and all of those big concepts. So people, once that draft EIS comes out, they'll be able to give much better feedback to sound transit. They'll have a much, you, you, they're not gonna be starting at zero. So please, city of Seattle, do it now, don't wait. Got off my soapbox. <laughs> no, and I, that's why I felt bad because we actually been doing so much together. So I just, and Sarah, I know you just came on. I just, I wanted to say we didn't get a chance to really talk about that tonight, but we have been doing quite a bit of early work together. Quite a bit. And, and I want to add on, you know, I hear you loud and clear, Deb, and we do have quite a bit of engagement originally that we had been planning to do last year. And of course, you know, COVID and the, the whole world has changed. Um, and we have been largely waiting on communities readiness to participate, which varies neighborhood by neighborhood, but are definitely looking to be out there in community with uh, having these meetings so that folks are ready to engage with the EIS process. Sarah, uh, you I know, would the, say that West Seattle is ready. Yes, I, <laughs> I can see Hooray! that. I love it. An EIS 101 session. Sounds great. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> Another question was, um, have the construction costs increased for the tunnel options? Hey, Hill, do you wanna to try to address that one? Uh, yes. Um, uh, construction costs have increased generally for, for all the same reasons um, that, that I noted there. But I think um, I, had a, I did have a slide there and at the end that talked a little bit what, what the differential is, if you like, between tunnel and elevated options. Um, so although costs generally are increasing, we are seeing a little bit more of a convergence in the costs or the differential, if you like, um, has, has decreased between some of the tunnel options and, and the elevated options. Yeah, that's, that's the slide right there that, that sort of speaks to that. Um, it's probably not terribly surprising. A lot of what's driving up the cost of, of elevated structures is of course the development, the real estate that you're affecting, which um, as you can imagine, isn't, isn't as, it's still an issue with tunnel alternatives. And, you know, in the station areas, you still need to have, you know, property that you acquire, but along the, along the alignment itself, because you're underground, you don't have the same real estate impact. Hopefully this that this, answers okay, no, this is Deb and this, uh, this this comparison and the difference between 2.0 million and 2.1, sorry, billion and billion is making a lot of people very excited, which I'm sure you know. <laughs> the difference between the uh, third, um, between additional funding and the preferred alternative is so close now. So, yay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, um, Martin Pagel, would you be willing to ask your question um, about the cost increases? I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, okay. happy to do that. Thank you. Uh, at the beginning of the slides, when you talked about the the ballot, uh, this, uh, the tunnel and the West Seattle portion, uh, the number, yeah, that, that slide right there, it's, I, uh, the cost now is 3.174 mil, a billion. And what is the difference between that number and Cathal, the, the one you just showed where it shows between 1.6 billion and 2.2 billion. Yeah, um, that's just, actually, if you look at the footnote on this graphic here, um, what's shown on the screen here are the, are the costs for the West Seattle, the, the alternatives in the West Seattle Junction and the Delridge segments combined. So it's not the full cost of the West Seattle extension, it's just the cost within this area. But the purpose of this slide is really just to show the differential in costs between tunnel and elevated. Uh, so if you just look at the same, kind of the same beginning endpoints, um, uh, in this area, and you compare the costs, that, that's how you see it. But you're, you, you're correct. Overall, if you're looking at the entire West Seattle extension, it's a, it's a greater number than, than, than shown on that graphic. Okay. 
And Kales, okay. you so the, the rest of it is the Soto. Right, right. Yeah. The yeah. portion from okay. Soto to, to, to Delridge, if you like. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Okay, I don't see any more hands raised or questions right now. Michael? All right, um, we'll give people another moment or two to, you know, come up with some ideas. But of course, uh, this, I'm sure this will not be the last time um, that we have our guests from Sound Transit with us. Um, and again, folks can always feel free to uh, drop questions there. I have a question. In the chat. Oh, there's Marty. All right. Yeah, a couple of questions. The first one is um, your estimates for boardings have dropped from 42,000 to the mid 30s to between uh, the high 20s to the low 30s uh, for 2040. So I'm wondering what is the accurate number of boardings you're predicting for West Seattle in 2040? And could you also tell me when the peak, how much you expect at the peak? So do you expect uh, 5,000 people at morning peak from six to 9 a.m. or do you expect 7,500 out of that 28 to 30,000 boardings in 24 hour period? Um, this is Cahill. Um... So a lot of the information, the questions you're asking right now is information that we're updating and developing as part of the draft EIS. Um, I can't speak to it at this point in time. It's, it's still information that's in development um, based on our latest analysis, but not too long at all. We hope to have the draft EIS available, um, which, which I think we'll get into some of the questions, all the you know, peak, off peak, um, all those sort of questions that you're uh, uh, referring to. Second question is that I understand that you're getting pushback from the Avalon and Delbridge communities about 105 foot tall uh, scores of pylons in the neighborhoods uh, and pushbacks of pushback on sizes of stations. Uh, how are you uh, addressing that with the neighborhoods? Um, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, no, uh, well, so um, we do have multiple alternatives that we're looking at through the environmental process. And so there are some where we've got those taller guideways and they're connected to elevated stations in the junction, for example. And then there are some that do go into tunnels so they have lower height guideways. What we hope is that when we publish the draft, we we'll have information about the station sizes, the guideways and all um, of that information for people to be able to comment on and inform our board's confirmation or modification of the preferred alternative, um, refinements to the alternative. So, so that'll be part of that public conversation and process. We definitely have heard that concern, Marty. Thank you. Okay, and finally, um, I'm curious about how many people you anticipate displacing in the Avalon and Delridge areas and how many businesses you expect to close. That is also information that we'll be publishing in the draft EIS. So it'll be a lot of a lot of information for folks to look at and help them understand the trade-offs between these alternatives. And I do want to be able to come back here and share that information with you when we have it. Anybody else? All right. Well, um, we've got a few minutes left, so I'm going to, again, we'll thank uh, all of our guests for joining us. Um, this isn't quite as much fun as being in rooms uh, with uh, big screens to look at, uh, but, you know, um, we are always happy to have you with us and uh, hope to have you, have you again uh, not too far into the future this year. Um, I will uh, move us along and get us to wrap our meeting here. Let me bring slides back up. Um, so we've got a few minutes. Um, again, um, we're gonna have open discussion or maybe some chat there. Um, I think we will push this ahead um, to an, uh, our next meeting in February. Uh, if you've got any responses to either of these two questions that you want to get into the chat window right now so we can capture them and, you know, in case 
for some reason there's a conflict and you can't join us next month, um, or just want to give it some thought over the next couple of weeks, um, you know, we just want to uh, hear from you. What do you want to learn about in 2021? Um, our board members, we tend to be pretty darn certain as to who we want to invite um, and what topics we want to cover. And obviously, we keep our ears open and we hear from you uh, with emails um, and Facebook posts. Um, but, you know, maybe uh, you're new, maybe there's something that's been inspired by what you heard from Sound Transit, um, like, you know, the suggestion I had, maybe we want to do uh, some sort of, you know, EIS 101, so folks can understand what exactly is an EIS process, what is legally prescribed um, for the agencies to do, what isn't part of that, um, what's a valuable comment to make in that process versus a comment that may be important um, and may even be something that the agencies and elected officials want to hear, but isn't an, a comment that can actually influence that process. And so maybe that's an example of something we want to look at. Um, and also share to, with us, what are your top concerns? Um, you know, we share our goals um, and our priorities at the top of every meeting. Um, but uh, maybe you've seen the update for 2021, you think there's something that's missing there. Uh, maybe there's something that you think, uh, you know, uh, we are the West Seattle Transportation Coalition, but we're also aware that we're in a city council district that spans a little bit beyond West Seattle. And our detour in particular right now for the High Bridge is taking us through other parts of our uh, council district that we don't necessarily include when we talk about West Seattle. Um, and so maybe there are concerns uh, for folks in South Park and in, along the Duwamish um, that we haven't really had a great understanding of. So think about that. We'll, we'll have some more discussion on this next month. Um, and uh, with our last couple of minutes here, I want to check in. As I said, I was not aware of any old business or new business to add on to the agenda, uh, but board members may have something they need to bring up or guests. Um, this is Larry. I've got something I'll throw in. Um, I was kind of checking the email here recently and uh, Mick Schultz would very much like to come and speak to us about some T5 issues at either our March, April, or May meeting. Um, yes, um, I also spoken with uh, Mick and we, uh, we're, we're getting him slotted in. Okay, sounds great. I would like to apologize for not doing the press release. I dropped the ball on that and I'm going to work on that for next month. Um, okay. That's a good reminder here before um, all of our guests uh, flee um, that we, uh, we're always looking for new board members, but in particular right now as we're coming into a new year and updating some of our outreach materials. Um, we, are, uh, we are always thinking about who is and isn't at the table um, when we're having these conversations and, and figuring out what it is we wanna learn. Um, and as it should come as no surprise uh, to folks, if you're paying attention to the videos, since many of us board members have our videos on, um, you know, you'll notice a lot of uh, similarities amongst how uh, all of our board members here um, look. And, uh, you know, that's something that we are quite aware of as well, um, that we reflect particular demographics. Um, I believe we are all homeowners. Um, uh, we're all married. Um, and so, you know, at times in the past, we've had some other folks, um, we've had some uh, high school students um, on the board in the past. Um, and, you know, we would like to, again, really think about like, age diversity, race diversity, you know, do we have renters, do we have business owners, or do we have, uh, you know, people who work here uh, in West Seattle, but maybe don't necessarily live here. Um, and so folks who are on the call, if you can think of people that you say, hey, they talk my ear off about this and let me, you know, connect them with the Transportation Coalition, um, we really like to, would like to broaden our perspectives a bit more and we're asking for your help. Um, and so that's part of what Kate's talking about is um, as we publicize some of our updated materials, we also want to uh, put out that call again to the broader community. Um, anybody else have anything else? We're at 826. All right, I'll move to adjourn. <laughs> yeah, let's give give ourselves four minutes. Sounds good to me. Is there a second? I second. All right. Uh, without further ado, then, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we'll get the video up um, by this weekend. Um, we hope to see you again uh, 
on February, I want to say it's the 25th, but I should look at the calendar to double check. Um, oh, look at that. I'm right. February 25th. Um, so uh, please join us again uh, then. Otherwise, uh, come join us on Facebook and participate in some conversations there. And we will talk to you all soon. All right, everybody. Right. Thank you, Mike. Night. All right. Good night. Good night, Michael. Good night, everyone. Good night. Yep. Happy New Year. Happy, yeah, happy new year. <laughs> yeah, happy new year, everyone. Oh, we did that at our our weekly get together or whatever.